Okay, in this video, I'm going to go over immigration. Um, I'm only going to stick to the United States on this one. I'm going to be covering the history of immigration a bit up until 1965 and focus on that act a little bit because that's the act, uh, 1965 immigration bill that most people refer to when they look at the like ch ethnic change of the country. I'm not going to focus on like random people especially in like the more modern age of like random articles or like Barbara Spector type shit of people like saying like, Oh, we need more immigration or whatever. And like people do like the early Wikipedia, early life search or whatever. I'm not going to focus on those people because those people are like nobodies. They don't hold any institutional power. They just like write articles or whatever. And I don't even, you could find articles written by any number of people from any different background to advocate or don't advocate immigration. Like I can look to, People like Stephen Miller, but I'm not going to even look at that guy. So I'm mainly just going to be focusing on the history, some people involved in the administrations. Um, and then later I want to look at the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society and kind of compare that to the Christian churches and how they responded to refugees and immigration. Um, I think that's a pretty good comparison to make because both kind of claim like biblical morality uh, somewhat um, for their reasoning for helping out immigrants and refugees. Um, so that's going to be what this video is about. Real quick, I just want to add that the main source book I'm going to be using is One Mighty and Irresistible Tide by uh, Jia Lin Yang, I believe is how you pronounce her name, uh, the author. So I'm going to be using that book for the overall broad history. And then there's a couple books I'm going to be using for um, the Catholic and overall Christian view of uh, refugee and immigrant uh, aid. So I will put those in the description as well. And I'll try to like put all the sources, like, pictures that I use and source them in the description. So just to simplify it, immigration wasn't really a huge deal in the early mid 1800s. There was just other issues that the US was working on like gaining new territories, getting new states, westward expansion, the civil war. Um, slavery. So immigration just wasn't really too much on the radar, at least in terms of how we view it now. Uh, there was certainly parties who looked unfavorably on like Catholic immigrants and stuff like that. Um, but it wasn't until 1882 that there was like a big piece of legislation on immigration. Um, and this is all just to simplify things like you can always go more into details. But the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 um, bars Chinese immigrants and they were pretty uh, useful in the West, building railroads and like working on farms and stuff. The only reason I mention this is because once the Chinese Exclusion Act is uh, passed, it causes more of a reliance on Mexicans uh, from south of the border of Mexico. And that uh, leads into the Bracero program later on. So westward or Western states and businesses had, from a very early time, had relied on Mexican workers um, and that's just going to be important later on, obviously, because clearly in the modern age, like Latino immigration is like the biggest thing in the country in terms of like controversy and numbers. But that's just kind of the beginnings of that. And then obviously in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there's immigration from Southern Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe. So that just means like Italian Catholics, Russian Orthodox people, Jews from Central and Eastern Europe. So just quite different from the previously seen immigration. So that causes a lot of controversy, I suppose you'd say. Uh, there's always been kind of a suspicion of the Catholic Church in the United States that has a long history. Um, and then also there is a suspicion of Jews because of the Bolsheviks. Um, I did a video on that. But anyway, so there's a uh, suspicion of Catholics and Jews and basically just foreigners in general who aren't wasps. Um, so that leads to the 1924 Act that is basically like a Nordic Immigration Act, you could say. And that act relies on the, uh, essentially what it does is it only allows immigration from people who are currently in the country based on their uh, percentages on the 1890 census, when there was a much recent, more recent 1920 census that the act could have pulled its numbers from. And in so doing, it basically drops all of the um, numbers allowed from countries such as like Italy, Ireland, Poland, places like that. And anyway, so from these groups, there are, I guess, responses and kind of 
outcries against this act. Um, most of the groups, like whether they be Catholic groups or Jewish groups, they don't necessarily have anything against like immigration caps and immigration laws per se, but they just don't like the fact that it's pulling from the 1890 census because it's just an obvious way to reduce numbers of essentially Catholics and Jews in the country and try to increase the number of like Anglo-Saxon Protestants. So you can find from both of those groups just kind of arguments against this act, as well as arguments coming from business leaders who want access to cheap labor, and that's something you see throughout American immigration history. But it passes anyway in 1924, and that's the law of the land, more or less, until 1965. Uh, we do see, like, refugee uh, refugees come in during, like, wars and stuff, but more or less, that's the law of the land. Just to look more specifically at the rhetoric of anti-Catholicism, anti-Judaism, and then the pushback from those groups against that rhetoric, uh, we can see one pamphlet entitled America's Greatest Enemy, the Foreign Language Press. Um, and this pamphlet was mainly anti-Roman Catholic and saw the Catholic Church as a um, threat to American democracy and like American republicanism. Uh, but I think it also, or no, it does uh, also like reference Jews and it basically attacks both Jews and Catholics as being like not the not Christian, like either non-Christian at all or just the, the wrong type of Christian and that both are a threat to American democracy. So, and even before that, there's like the Know Nothing Party and anti-Catholicism in the U.S. Um, there's definitely some anti-Jewish sentiment, but it's not as big. I think it's mainly just because America more or less was founded as a wasp nation and Protestants have more of a history with Catholicism than Judaism, at least from like Puritan times and whatever. Um, but anyway, so we can see that the Catholic Church responded by forming a council called the National Catholic Welfare Council, and this had an immigration bureau as part of it, and this was formed from uh, a Catholic organization uh, in World War One that was formed to, like, help Catholics in World War One, like American Catholics, um, at war, but this later turned into this organization that was anti- anti-Catholic immigration, I guess you'd say. So they pushed back against anti-Catholic rhetoric and tried to, you know, push for, or push against barriers to uh, Catholic immigration into the U.S. Um, another example, uh, even before the 1924 Act, is the Immigration Act of 1917, which is known as the Literacy Act, and this was to prevent any immigrants coming over who didn't know how to read or write. Um, Catholic groups saw this as anti-Catholic as well, because many Catholics from uh, Eastern and Southern Europe just didn't know how to write at the time, and they argued that it was an anti-Catholic thing. So that's just like another little add-on. And yeah, the NWC was definitely anti-1924 Act, at least in terms of quotas, because they saw that as anti-Catholic. And in looking at the Jewish pushback to the 1924 Act, uh, we have people like Emanuel Seller, who would later on become pivotal in the 1965 Act, um, so he'll be later on in this video. Uh, we have people like Fiorello LaGuardia. He was a half Jewish, half Italian U.S. congressman. He pushed back on the bill. Um, also, we have Congressman Adolf Sabbath, um, who was against the quotas, but that he favored uh, excluding ja the Japanese and like other basically non-white people um, in terms of immigration. And also William Eden, editor of the Yiddish Day. And he also had a similar uh, perspective that basically... The quota system was bad because it um, was biased against Catholics and Jews, but that he was fine with uh, a whites-only type of immigration system. So I, I just mentioned all that because I think it's a little ironic that a decent amount of like people from like Eastern Europe, or at least their heritage from Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, Italians, Irish, whatever, Catholic Orthodox people, and today's right, they kind of have this like anti-Jewish vibe going on and also this like pro usa america first anti-immigration stance which is fine but i think it's a little ironic that they their heritage matches pretty closely with the jewish history of this because both groups were kind of looked at with suspicion um but both groups in their own way advocated for their own immigration uh for their own uh groups essentially but it wasn't an anti-white thing it was just like a pro European in general thing, if that makes any sense. 
And I do want to quickly go to an idea um, known as Jewish cosmopolitanism. And we see this uh, arrive in the United States in the early 1900s with all the immigration. Um, we have the play entitled The Melting Pot, which has become kind of like a famous saying, the melting pot, like U.S. is a melting pot, by Israel Zwangwil. Zwangwil. And uh, this play essentially is like a more or less a celebration of the United States being a melting pot of all the European peoples. So in the play, he talks about like Russians and Jews getting along and Germans and whoever, like French and like Irish and English, whatever, like everyone getting along and that the U.S. becomes a melting pot, but only for European nations. And it's not necessarily like a melting, at least in the original sense, what Zangwill wanted to say was not like a melting pot of like every people on earth. It was just like a European thing. Uh, I'm not saying that's good or bad or whatever. I'm just saying that's what he thought. And Teddy Roosevelt also was a fan of the play. Um, but he's pretty famous for his whole notion against hyphenated Americans. Like, he didn't want Italian-Americans, Irish-Americans, whatever. He just wanted Americans. But in that sense, he believed that was only possible with Europeans, not, like, everyone. Obviously, that idea gets pushed later on um, for, like, non-white people to become, like, Americans as well. But that's not the case, like, originally. And I want to juxtapose that with uh, something called... Um, Protestant cosmopolitanism, or you could call it like post-Protestant cosmopolitanism. And this idea came forth from uh, a book I read called Protestants Abroad, and it's about uh, missionary activity from Protestants coming from the U.S., uh, going to countries in Asia and non-white countries, and they bring back an appreciation of those non-white countries, and eventually they lead to more of a sympathy a sympathetic view of non-white countries, specifically Asian countries, um, from missionaries and also their children. That's what it mainly focuses on. Uh, the children of missionaries like Pearl S. Buck, um, Walter Judd, people like that. So, and you can see that later on with how uh, Japanese and other Asians are eventually like included into immigration and naturalization processes. So it's just an interesting juxtaposition. I do recommend that book. But then let's go back to the point of the video. And I just want to add a quick note about eugenics. This movement was popular at the time as well, um, with people like Madison Grant, who wrote The Passing of the Great Race, Charles Davenport. Uh, the second, I believe, uh, rendition of the KKK was pretty popular at this time. Basically, these people and movements, um, they saw Jews and Catholics, and all non-whites, but um, they only saw Northwestern Europeans as being racially superior, and even other Europeans and Jews were just not part of the Nordic people, not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So they were not only from a religious or a political uh, view, but also just like a racial, biological, ethnic view. They were seen as inferior and not really wanted, so this also um, influenced the 1924 Act. Moving on with the rise of the Nazis and Hitler in 1933 up until World War II, this creates the issue of refugees, specifically Jewish refugees for the U.S. Um, there are Jews who want to come over from Germany uh, before the war, and some do, but it's not like every Jew can just come over because of the racial quotas that are in place, and there's not really like a process for refugees at the time, so... Um, and that like is famously exemplified in the rejection of the St. Louis, the ship carrying people from continental Europe, and it's you know has to go from place to place, and eventually just gets rejected. Um, later on, the War Refugee Board is created in 1944, and there's a Displaced Persons Act in 1948. Uh, this act in 1948, some people say, has some like anti-Jewish elements, uh, kind of behind the scenes because. It puts, puts a priority on people from, like, the Western liberated areas and not really the Eastern, so it targets more just, like, Western Europeans and not necessarily, like, the Eastern Jews who survived the war. Um, but I just mentioned that because refugees later on become um, a pretty significant loophole, I guess you'd say, for immigration in the U.S. with people from, like, Cuba, Haiti, um, and other places, Vietnam, etc., and so the last important piece of immigration legislation that's passed before 1965 is the 1952 McCarran-Walter Act. And this act 
more or less upholds the 1924 quota system, but it differs in a couple of important ways. First, it abolishes all racial barriers to immigration and naturalization to the U.S. Um, that has nothing to do with the Western Hemisphere. There's no real legislation in regards to the Western Hemisphere uh, before this time, but it applies mainly to Asian countries. Um, and a little interesting fact is that Walter Judd, one of the people um, profiled in the Protestants Abroad book, he's pretty uh, important in this regard to opening up Asian immigration and Asian naturalization. And also the JACL, the Japanese American Citizens League, is also a proponent of this. It doesn't change the immigration patterns like too much or at all, really, because it just adds a couple of small quotas to Asian countries. But it's the principle of the matter. It, for the first time, allows immigration and naturalization from Asian countries that were not already allowed under like World War II, countries like China and so on. And then furthermore, the act allows for a process of refugee assistance to the president, and that is influential later on. So people like Edward Seller and Lehman, um, two pretty prominent Jewish congresspeople, congressmen, uh, they are not in favor of this law, um, mainly because it's too restrictive, but it doesn't matter because it ends up passing. And it's just kind of ironic that in the seeds of this law, there are some things that go on to uh, change the immigration patterns later on in the country. But the 1965 bill does that on a way larger scale. So let's go to the 1965 bill. So the beginnings of the 65 bill have root in the Kennedy administration. There was support from both sides of the aisle to uh, reform immigration at this time. Democrats usually use more of a civil rights argument because the civil rights movement was obviously underway in the 60s. And uh, Republicans saw that the uh, amount of immigration was too low in terms of labor and workers. Also, polling showed that there was a slight majority of Americans who favored uh, changing the quota system. But like always, they weren't necessarily in favor of more immigration numbers, but they just didn't really uh, like the quota system itself. And perhaps most importantly, the issue of the Cold War at this time caused many people in the government to consider that the quota system just didn't really make the U.S. look good on a global scale. Uh, kind of like Jim Crow laws, it just made the U.S. look morally inferior, more or less, um, to the Soviet Union, which advocated, uh, at least in principle, like anti-racism and anti-imperialist policies, whereas the U.S. Uh, still was had legal discrimination on the books and... Um, and its immigration policy just didn't look good to like non-aligned countries, um, especially in Latin America and Asia, who they wanted to, you know, dissuade from going down the communist route. And uh, this is also pretty important for the Johnson administration later on, who actually uh, passes the law. But as for Kennedy himself, he's influenced by a scholar, um, Oscar Handlin, who's a Jewish scholar who wrote, uh, one of the early writers on immigration history in the U.S., and he, and he is known for kind of putting the seeds of the idea. He didn't coin the term, but the whole idea of a nation of immigrants. He like kind of started the seed of that idea. But even he, he uh, while being against the quota system, did not think that overturning the quota system would have like a huge impact on the number of immigrants or like the racial. Uh, percentages in the U.S. and you see that later on with the people who passed the bill too like they on either side like none of them think thought it would be like too much of a drastic change and Kennedy himself actually has a book more or less ghost written under his name but it's actually written by one of his aides Feldman under the auspices of the ADL so I mean I'm not gonna lie that's like a totally Jewish thing ADL was Jewish uh, Feldman's Jewish but again it's uh, the book Nation of Immigrants it's also drawing upon the work of Arthur Schlesinger, Schlesinger Jr., who was a historian and public intellectual who was a supporter of Kennedy's and later on Johnson's liberalizing programs. Um, he's kind of like Lenin. I looked at his early Wikipedia page. I think he has like one Jewish grandfather, but for all intents and purposes, he was like Protestant. And in terms of aides, Kennedy definitely had a decent amount of Jewish aides who worked on immigration like Schley, Walensky, Ullman, Abba Schwartz. Um, but he also worked with like congressmen who were Gentile, like Philip Hart in the Senate, who has half the bill named after him. 
and Kenneth Keating as well, and Peter Rodino, and Deputy Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach. I just I'm just name dropping a bunch of people because I just want to show that there's like both Jews and Gentiles working on this thing. It's not like some weird conspiracy. And once they settle on some legislation, the plan is essentially to abolish uh, the quota system and to open up Asian immigration, but also put an overall cap to immigration and more or less just focus on a merit-based um, immigration by need in terms of like professional class people, uh, experts in whatever field. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because Kennedy ends up getting assassinated and Johnson takes over the presidency. And so that opens up a whole new can of worms there. So once Johnson takes over, uh, immigration takes kind of a backseat, obviously, because they just have to transition to a new administration. But eventually it comes back on the table and Johnson gets to a point where the immigration subcommittee in Congress at least starts to hear out the case for replacing the quota system. And one of the ways that this hearing and debate over immigration was allowed is that the leader of the immigration subcommittee, Michael Fagan, I believe that's how it's pronounced, did not really in, like the quota system anymore uh, from the like right-wing kind of anti-immigration perspective. The 52 Act uh, seemingly had failed. There was more immigrations than, or immigrants than there, they thought there would be. So he wanted immigration reform too, in a sense. But what he wanted, and this is really important and later on is um, talked about in an Atlantic article that I will show and put in the description, is that Fagan wanted uh, family reunification to be prioritized and not a merit-based system. And this eventually led to what is known as like chain migration, which is like still with us today and like a huge problem. Um, but that is where this actually started with this 1965 bill. Um, he also wanted to put a cap on immigrants from the Western Hemisphere, which had never been done before. There was never a law putting a cap on Western immigration. So that also uh, gets passed. So it's kind of an interesting case that people point to the 65 Act. Um, it actually, for the first time, puts a cap on Western Hemisphere immigration, which a lot of people don't know. Uh, but at the same time, puts in family reunification, which leads to a bunch of problems later on. Now, during the debates in the uh, subcommittee of immigration, there are interviews and testimonies from certain people, such as uh, Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State at the time, Bobby Kennedy, and then also Mike Masoka, who is from the Japanese American Citizens League, who advocated for the 1952 McCarran-Walter Act on the basis that it opened up immigration uh, naturalization for Japanese people. But at this point, he's there to um, support the new 1965 immigration bill because it would give even more uh, numbers, more or less, to Asian and Japanese immigrants. And interestingly enough, there were um, representatives of the AFL-CIO, which is the largest uh, trade union in the country. And this union was uh, first established by Samuel Gompers. He was kind of an interesting guy, Jewish, uh, supported organized labor, um, but he was also anti-immigration. He just thought that would reduce uh, worker wages and just not be beneficial overall to the country. Whereas further leaders of the FAL-CIO, um, to what I could find out, most of them seem to be like Irish people, um, and they all seem to be pro-immigration, such as people like George Meany. So just kind of an interesting dichotomy there. And eventually the bill ended up passing in 1965 pretty easily in the House and Senate. Um, ironically enough, if Johnson had lost to Barry Goldwater, who's half Jewish, the bill probably wouldn't have passed under a Goldwater administration. And he also opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, so just take that for what it's worth. But anyways, uh, the bill passes and pretty much everyone on both sides of the aisle believe the bill is not like a revolutionary thing. It won't really change the population too drastically. But later, uh, history proves them all basically wrong. And the main catalyst of this is not necessarily the bill abolishing quotas or opening up immigration to like the Asian uh, Pacific Triangle, they called it. But it's more the chain migration mechanism of the bill which leads to chain migration, family reunification. And that's basically the fault of Fagan. 
And he, his whole idea behind that was to like bolster more or less European family reunification, but it had basically the opposite effect of allowing chain migration of a bunch of non-Europeans later on. So that's just a little irony of history there. And then also refugees um, do contribute to the growing number of overall immigration, but that was already um, a process that was ongoing since the end of World War II, and the Maker and Walter Act uh, led to a refugee mechanism as well. So it wasn't. A, I think it liberalized refugee uh, laws a bit, but I don't think it like was a pioneering bill in that regard. And so that's the law of the land, more or less, up until now uh, has effects and. There's a bunch of refugees that come in, more immigration, and I'm going to end this video soon, and I will just do a video later uh, comparing the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society and churches, uh, church aid to refugees and immigrants, because I don't want to make this video too long. But real quick, I do want to just add in the 1986 uh, Simpson-Mazzoli bill, and this was the big uh, amnesty bill under Reagan that legalized like millions of illegal immigrants, mainly from Mexico in the US. It was supposed to have the effect of uh, putting more like border restrictions and enforcement after the amnesty. But I just want to call that out, um, that it was the first big amnesty to illegal immigrants from south of the border. And you can look up Mazzoli and Simpson. I mean, they're definitely not like Jewish people or whatever. Uh, and then later on the 1990 Bush Act, and this bill just, further liberalized and reformed immigration um, and increased immigration caps, made knowledge of English no longer a, requ a requirement, um, entered in a uh, immigration lottery, and this bill was introduced by Ted Kennedy. So um, the Kennedy family uh, is a very, has a very like big history, obviously, in the U.S., and they're very like liberal, and especially in terms of like civil rights integration. So I guess just to conclude this video, I think it's pretty clear that like Jews and Catholics, I would say, uh, were pretty instrumental in reforming uh, immigration laws. But I think uh, the biggest radical change that really took place with immigration was the Fagan uh, tampering with the original bill uh, that turned into the 1965 bill. Um, without that, it would have just been like a merit-based uh, immigration bill with no chain migration. And without chain migration, that would I mean, that is like the exponential uh, mechanism for like the numbers we see later on. And yeah, and then when uh, with the war on terror and stuff like that, uh, immigration, it just isn't as much in the uh, national eye, I guess you'd say. But with Obama and Trump gets more uh, focus, uh, Trump or Obama with DACA and Trump with the whole like wall that he didn't end up building or whatever. But it's just to... Um, well, no, I think I said basically everything I want to say on this. Um, so anyway, uh, that's my video. I'm going to conclude it here. I'm going to put sources in the description. And then my next video, I'm going to try to release real quick about um, uh, mainly church aid and refugee uh, assistance. And I'm going to try to like incorporate that with like the view of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society as this kind of like overarching nefarious organization when that like, totally isn't the case. But anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you around.